So I'm going to be just shameless. If you've read Familiaris Consortio, document by Pope John Paul II, it's not going to be anything good. <laughs> if you haven't read Familiaris Consortio, and you're seriously concerning uh, call to marriage, or if you're already married and you haven't read it, you need to. Because what I'm going to do is just pinpoint some things, but the little aspects that JB2 points out, out to us is an endeavor. Often, often many of them are endeavors uh, for years on their own. <clears throat> Not only theologically, intellectually understanding it, but then being able to apply it to our everyday life and trying to live that reality. And so I was asked to speak on Jesus Christ as the bridegroom of the church. And this is one of the titles within the, the document. So here we have an image of the wedding feast at Cana, and uh, you guys all know the story, it's one of the first uh, miracles that Jesus performed um, in his public ministry. And one of the, the beautiful aspects is that Christ really is the center of the story. Right? It says Jesus and his disciples went to a wedding in Cana. But it wasn't about the couple. <laughs> it was about Jesus. Right? Um, and so there's a there's a great mystery that is brought to the, the sacrament of marriage in this story. One of the important aspects is the six jars of water that um, are asked to be filled with water, Jesus uh, transforms them into wine, and it is the best wine that they've, they've had all night. This obviously is a foreshadowing of the, the cross, right? Um, and the, the beauty of this, uh, many biblical scholars, I'm sure there's some biblical scholars here, maybe we can uh, fill in some the details, but six jars, seven is a perfect number. Where's the seventh uh, jar? The seventh jar comes in at the, the Last Supper and the Crucifixion. All right, and so in the real way, the Crucifixion is the fulfillment of the, uh, the foreshadowing in the wedding feast of Canaan. Um, I had the, the privilege of celebrating a wedding this summer, and the gospel was the wedding feast of Canaan. And what really struck me was that Mary told the servants, do whatever he tells you. All right? Do whatever he tells you. The wedding couple is the servant to Jesus Christ in the sacrament of marriage. All right? Jesus Christ is the one who is the, the active, what do you want to say, the active character in the sacrament of marriage. All right? Do whatever he tells you, not only on the day of your wedding, but every single day of your life as a married couple. All right? And the beauty is, we put in something so simple, water. And what does Jesus Christ do with that through the sacrament and the grace that is given to us through the sacrament of marriage? He transforms it into something much better. All right, and so I, one of my insights, I guess, that the Lord kind of shared with me was, you have to fill that those jars with your water, with your sins, with your struggles, with your joys, with whatever it is. But you have to fill those jars, and you have to give it to Jesus, and there He will transform it. All right. The beauty of the sacrament is that he will transform it into himself. All right. And so the, the beauty of the sacrament of marriage is that it is a sacrament. It, it, it embodies Jesus Christ. All right. So I just wanted to give you kind of an image uh, to initial, uh, initially get started with, uh, with this talk. Um, and the beauty of it is through 
Um, throughout marriage, we need to constantly be walking with both Christ and the Blessed Mother. All right? Mary shows us when something is lacking. She points it out to Jesus. And there Jesus acts. All right? And so within the sacrament of marriage, we need to go to bless the Blessed Mother so that she can reveal to us where things are lacking that we can bring to Christ so that he can transform it into something uh, perfect. Familiaris Consortio, paragraph 13, uh, is going to be kind of the highlight of the, the talk tonight, even though I'll be pulling from various other paragraphs of uh, this document. I think paragraph 13 really is what we're trying to focus on, and that is Jesus Christ is the bridegroom of the church, um, which is kind of the, the, the sacrament of matrimony. All right, and this is I I put in the search find, and I put in sacrament, and this was the paragraph that had the most words. <laughs> So I hope you guys all can read this. The, the first uh, section says, The communion between God and his people finds its definitive fulfillment in Jesus Christ. The bridegroom who loves and gives himself as the Savior of humanity, uniting it to himself as his body. All right. The communion between God and his people finds its definitive fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Um, the bridegroom who loves and gives himself as the savior of humanity. He is the one who embodies what marriage is all about. All right. He unites himself to us. All right. And so the, the, the church talks about this marriage that happens in the incarnation. And it is in that that the Lord is teaching all of humanity how to properly love. Jesus Christ is the full communication of the love of the Holy Trinity. All right. So, I don't know about you, but I never tire of going through this reflection. The reality that the Holy Trinity, from all time, has been there, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He pours himself out in creation because goodness cannot hold itself back. It has to give. It has to be, cre it has to be creative. All right. In that creation, man falls and things get twisted. And so, God from all time, the beginning of time, from the fall of Adam and Eve, had this plan to redeem humanity. And so, he takes on humanity to himself. He marries humanity. You say, ah, that's beautiful. <laughs> well, no, no, no. That's an eternal divide that humanity can never make up. Ever. Cannot make up. So the fact that he would marry humanity and take humanity to himself, he's drawing us into the greatest relationship that man could ever, ever be a part of. The relationship of the Holy Trinity. And we become intimate participants in that, in that relationship. All right? And so this, this reality of the communion between God, between God and his people finds its the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the fullest communication of God. We, we encounter that in Jesus Christ. All right. um, the bridegroom who loves and gives himself as a savior of humanity, uniting it to himself as his body. All right. Um, we're, we're going to keep going through this over and over again, hopefully in different, uh, from different perspectives. Um, but the incarnation and the hypostatic union, which is the union of God's 
divinity and the humanity into one person is absolutely crucial to our understanding of, of marriage. All right, and we don't have to get into this right now, but I, I just want to say, like, this is why the synod is such a big deal. Divorce is a big deal. It is an embodiment of the covenant that God made with humanity. Can you ever imagine God not uniting himself to humanity, taking on human flesh? Without it, we would have nothing. With it, we have everything. And if marriage between a man and a woman is sealed by God himself, in order to communicate this profound reality, who are we as men to divide that which God has united? We can't. Even the church in all of its power has not the power to do that. We can proclaim something that is not there, but we cannot break a bond that was united by God. All right. And so this reality of the mystery of the incarnation and the hypostatic union is intimately tied into the mystery and our understanding of the sacrament. That reveals the original truth of marriage, the truth of the beginning, and freeing man from his hardness of heart. He makes man capable of realizing this truth in its entirety. All right? You guys all know, but go back to Genesis. That's where the marriage begins between Adam and Eve. And in a, in a real sense, before the fall, that's what we're trying to get back to in our humanity, to love the other selflessly, generously, faithfully, all right, without any twists of wrong desires or thoughts, hopes, dreams, but perfect relationship that is faithful, that is forever, all right, that is free, a free gift of oneself. All right. Um, and I was I was struggling in naming the title of this talk because I think this is at the very heart of the entire document. I think. What what is the, the sacrament of marriage? It is giving man and woman the grace to soften their hearts in order to love appropriately. To love in the way that God has loved us. And to love him in return along with spouse and others. Alright? Um, so Christ comes to show us how to do this. Um, he he really uh, ingrained it into our nature from the beginning. All right, Mar marriage was a natural, um, what do you want to say, relationship that God intended from the beginning. All right, between Adam and Eve. Um, and it is it is through the the grace of the sacrament that we are. Uh, able to realize this truth in its entirety. Okay. Marriage and the natural institution raised to a sacrament. All right. We talked about Adam and Eve a little bit as the natural institution. Christ raises it to, um, to the level of the sacrament. Again, continuing on paragraph 13 of Familiaris Consortio. This revelation reaches its definitive fullness in the gift of love which the Word of God makes to humanity in assuming a human nature and in the sacrifice which Jesus Christ makes of himself on the cross for his bride and church. All right, so this revelation reaches its definitive fullness in the gift of love. And so now we have to study what happens when God wills that his, the word that created all things should become flesh and dwell among us. What happens in the heart of God? Well, 
First off, the fact that anything would exist already is a communication of the heart of God, of his goodness, all right, his generosity, the kind of procreative nature. And then we have all of the Old Testament in which God says, I am your God and you are to be my people. There's this covenant made in this fidelity. It's this continuous gift of love that God is trying to communicate and then communicates in its fullness in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, and this gift of love is what the husband and the wife try to embody in their daily lives. Not only in the, the physical, conjugal <coughs> of making love, but in every single act of it, every single day. They are trying to make a gift that is free of themselves, given for, to the other. All right? And then the ability to then receive the rest of reciprocal love of the other. All right? And in our fallen human nature, we do not know how to do that well. Or at all. <laughs> in our fallen human nature. To, to give that freely and faithfully to give ourselves to the other, but then to also be able to receive as well. All right. And these next two sections here, I think are the two pillars on which the, the church builds her own understanding of, of marriage. And that is the word of God makes to humanity in assuming human nature. It is the incarnation. All right. The word becoming flesh, and I, I talked about that already a little bit. The, the profundity of the word becoming flesh and the hypostatic union. And that that bond cannot be separated at all. All right. Which gives us the bond that we have within the sacrament of marriage. Um, and it's and it's a and it's a perfect, complete bond. Um, nothing is lost in God's divinity. Nothing is lost in His humanity. They're both perfectly whole, and they're perfectly united. All right, just think about that. Two people in the sacrament of marriage are perfectly themselves, and the other is perfectly themselves given to one another perfectly and perfectly united into one. That is what the sacrament of marriage ought to be. All right? Nothing is lost that ought not be lost, which is that which God created in each and every one of us. All right? And we can get into this a little bit more if we have time. But this is why it's important that the couples know themselves extremely well, that they're real with themselves, and that they approach the sacrament of marriage in that full understanding of themselves. Because if you do not possess knowledge of yourself, what the hell do you have to give? <laughs> what do you have? All you have is yourself to give. And so you need to know yourself in order to give yourself. And man is a mystery unto himself, which means that we need Jesus Christ to reveal who we are. All right? And so this, this reality of the incarnation is one of the kind of cornerstones, pivotal points on which the sacrament of marriage is built. And in the sacrifice which Jesus Christ makes of himself on the cross for his bride, the church. All right? And this is where we come to a deeper and fuller understanding of what love truly is. All right? Where we choose the other for the other, and we give ourselves completely to the other, for the sake of the other. It's 
a, it's, a, it's like, it's the purest act of love. That we would lose our life in order that the other might have life. There's no selfishness in it. All right? There's also the fact that there is going to be sacrifices, there's going to be struggle, there's going to be difficulty, and as Jesus Christ picked up the cross and carried it, so we must also pick it up and carry it. That means your crap, and it means the other's crap. You have to pick up with the grace of Jesus Christ. We embrace that cross and we carry it. And let me tell you, in today's culture and society, there's going to be a pretty serious cross for you and anybody else who engages in the sacrament of marriage. Because we come with all the baggage that we have. And as a couple, you are to walk together, carrying that, purifying it, sanctifying it. And so, the reality of marriage means that we are embracing the cross. That when we get to the cross, and we turn back, and those who are closest to us are the ones who have hurt us the most, we look to our Father and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. All right. When you see a couple married for 60 years, those folks know forgiveness because they would not be where they're at if it wasn't for forgiveness. And it may not be a perfect relationship, but in order for them to be living together for 60 years and still together, there's certainly some forgiveness that has played a part in it. All right? And there's going to be serious <coughs> wounds not only from your spouse, but from those who are closest to you, your very offspring. I know parents who've worked hard at their marriage, they have worked hard at raising their children, and their children have completely fallen away from the faith and have fallen away from them. You cannot tell me that they do not know what a sword of piercing the heart doesn't feel like. They know that. Every time they think about their children, it brings them sadness and hurt. And yet most of them have the greatest and most pure love for them because they want nothing more than for them to know Jesus Christ and to be in union with Him. All right. Um, Yeah, obviously we, we know the the scripture passage, Ephesians 5, which talks about, you know, husbands love your wives as Christ loved his church. Women be submissive to your husbands. Alright, as I think it says as the church is to, to, to Christ. Right. And this St. Paul is not talking kind of figuratively. I think he's talking actually. He's not trying to wanting you to read through the lines. All right? Because the reality is, if the husband loves, loves his wife as Christ loved his church, he will provide everything to the church that she needs. Everything. Meaning his very life blood will be poured out. And it's not a mindless, I'm going to work myself to the grave. It is very intellectually full of knowledge, intentionally seeking the good of the other. Having full possession of the emotions, being able to love the other with the fullness of of his emotions, loving her with the fullness of his very body. 
the fullness of the human person is being given. And so if a wife has that kind of husband who is going to love her, why would she not submit to him? Why do these relationships begin to break down? I think because of a lack of trust. And sometimes rightfully so. But if a man is not giving everything that she needs, she begins to doubt that he will. And so she starts living on her own. Even though they are in union physically. And same thing. If he's not receiving the support or the love of the spouse, then he might start seeking his own fulfillment on his own. All right? So this complete giving of oneself. Now it's not saying, obviously we know this, it's not saying that the man is greater than the wife, the wife needs to be the complete slave of the man, right? <laughs> That's, they're equal in dignity, but they have different roles. Masculinity and femininity, they are two different realities. And they are complementary. All right? Believe it or not, they are. All right? Not just physically, but on many other levels as well. In this sacrifice, there is entirely revealed that plan which God has imprinted on the humanity of man and woman since their creation. The marriage of baptized persons thus becomes a real symbol of that new and eternal covenant sanctioned in the blood of Christ. All right? This, this is where I think marriage goes from a natural institution and is raised to the level of sacrament. Is that now you become a real symbol. Okay, what what is what is well I should I should not get ahead of myself. Anyway. You become a real symbol as a very of that new and eternal covenant sanctioned in the blood of Christ. The spirit which the Lord pours forth gives a new heart. All right, as I talked about, the hardness of heart. This heals the hardness of heart. So the spirit which the Lord pours forth gives a new heart and renders man and woman capable of loving one another as Christ has loved us. So the elevation to that of a sacrament is the fact that you are given the grace to love in a way that Jesus Christ loves the church. You are called to a higher level of love than natural institution of marriage. It is to be perfected. With this, this is what will bring about the sanctifying of our culture. And God promises that in the sacrament of marriage, you will receive every grace needed to transform your state in life and the work that you do. And we'll get, we'll get more into this. The responsibility of those who are married is very grave. People look at the priest and say like, it's amazing, you can make Jesus Christ president in the Eucharist. You can make him president in the forgiveness of sins. It's like, yes, but you have to make him present in the world. And today, the world is not communicating Jesus Christ very well. And he wants to give you the grace to make it happen. In your, where, wherever you're at, He's not saying that you need to save the world. He's saying you need to save the world that you are in. And that God has put you in. And the people he has put in your life. And through the sacrament of marriage, you will receive that grace. As well as the other sacraments, obviously. Alright. But there's a real grace given in the 
the sacrament of marriage. Conjugal love reaches that fullness to which it is interiorly ordained. And I love this. This threw me off when I first read it. Conjugal charity. All right? Everybody knows what conjugal love is. I, I hope. All right? If you don't, don't be embarrassed. Let's play. <laughs> so conjugal love reaches that fullness to which it is interiorly ordained. Conjugal charity. Right? This is getting back to everything we do is an act of love for the other. Without conjugal charity, the conjugal love of the actual act itself becomes a lie. It becomes a stealing something for yourself that was never ordained to be that way. All right. And this is where men and women can feel raped in the act of the marital embrace. Why? Because they don't think the other loves them. And there's nothing in the every other day activity that shows them that they are loved. And so it is completely a selfish act. Right, but this conjugal charity, and there, I'm sure there's a boatload more meaning hidden in, the, in these words that I don't even know about. But my understanding of conjugal charity is this reality of this complete gift of ourself, not only in the sexual <coughs> act, but in every <coughs> of our lives is ordered. Okay, which is the proper and specific way in which the spouses participate in and are called to live the very charity of Christ who gave himself on the cross. And so all the other areas in which we are called to sacrifice, all right, gets drawn into this reality. and sterilization and all these other things 
Yes, the problem is sterilization. It is contraception. But the bigger problem is what lies underneath all of that. Contraception is only the fruit of a deeper sin. Which might be the fact that they don't know that they're loved by a God who wants to give them the grace to unite themselves to Him and that that is very fulfilling in order to trust Him with whatever He puts in their life. Alright? There's a lot of human crap that needs to get taken care of in that. Alright? There's a lot of things to work through before you start dealing with the church's teaching on contraception. And for some people, it's a serious act of faith because they don't understand it. They don't understand what true conjugal charity is all about. They don't understand what the conjugal act ought to be like. All right? Which automatically gets into a trust not only of your spouse, but a trust in the Lord himself. Um, yeah, and we, we all, like I said in the beginning, we all carry the, the sins of our past. We all carry our own kind of uh, twisted humanity with us in, into the sacrament of marriage. And the, the beauty of the, the sacrament is that the Lord teaches us how to love in a sacrificial manner, which helps us untwist all those things, be healed of them, and to live the life that we are called to live, that we were created for. And that is to give love, the gift of our lives, as, as a gift of love. Um, then it is, in fact, to the families of our times, the church must bring the unchangeable and ever new gospel of Jesus Christ. All right? For you called to marriage, we need to bring this not only into our own families, but into the entire world. All right? This understanding of the second marriage. Um, Alright, that's uh...